the advice was genius. And while any given sentence might not sound as strategic and thoughtful as the CEO of a Fortune 100 company, in substance, it was exactly the same. And so these folks know how to build a business. They know how to run their companies. They just don't realize that they have so much wisdom to share. So the book was meant to, to create that community and create that pragmatism to share the advice from other small business owners. The following is brought to you by Thrive, the end-to-end -end client experience platform that helps you get the job, manage the job, and get credit. Hey, hey, this is Gordon Henry at Winning on Main Street, the show devoted to small business success. And this week, we're fortunate to have two great guests, Jackie Reeses and Lauren Weinberg, who are here to discuss their new book, Self-Made Boss, Advice, Hacks, and Lessons from Small Business Owners. So Jackie, Lauren, welcome to Winning on Main Street. Hello. Thanks Hi. for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, uh, thanks for coming. And before we get started, brief intro on Jackie and Lauren. Uh, it's an impressive one. We often hear that small businesses are to the backbone of the American economy, over 30 million small businesses in the US, but so many entrepreneurs launch their businesses with little guidance. In the book, Self-Made Boss, Jackie and Lauren have written uh, an account of uh, how small business owners have built their companies from the ground up, obtaining startup capital, hiring staff, planning for growth, coping with the daily stresses of being their own boss. Jackie is the CEO of Post House Capital, a venture firm focused on building financial technology businesses. She's also the chair of the Economic Advisory Council for the San Francisco Federal Reserve and the former executive chairperson of Square Financial Services and former capital lead and head of the people team at Square. And Lauren is the chief marketing officer at Square. Lauren, uh, you're, you're the marketing whiz. Uh, who did you write this book for? Who, who's the ideal reader for your book? The ideal reader is anybody who is thinking about or is currently running their own business. We have tried to include every kind of business and every kind of person from all over the country. And the way the book was written, you could read the whole thing from cover to cover, but you could also go in and if you're sort of struggling with HR or with marketing or just how you get through some roadblocks, or maybe it's the financial section that you're really interested in, you could actually go in and just read that one chapter of the book. And so it's really meant to be for any business owner that's really in any stage. We have a chapter in the end about how to transition out of your business. Right. It seems like the book is is somewhat of a self-help guide, almost like a playbook for small businesses. Why was that necessary? There are so many books out there on small business. Why was, why was that format necessary? There's nothing like it. It's incredible what a dearth of information there is and really pragmatic information. And so you can scour the web and look for business plans or HR advice most of it applies to much bigger companies. And one of the frustrations I saw was um, you could go to these small towns across America and you'd hear brilliant advice from small business owners and advice to each other as well. And that's usually where they got kernels of wisdom. And while any given sentence might not sound as strategic and thoughtful as the CEO of a Fortune 100 company, in substance, it was exactly the same. And so these folks know how to build a business. They know how to run their companies. They just don't realize that they have so much wisdom to share. So the book was meant to, to create that community and create that pragmatism to share the advice from other small business owners. And the one thing that I'll add to that is that a lot of the challenges that these business owners have are the same ones everywhere, right? I think if you think about some of the, the challenges or the obstacles or the learnings or the things that they need to overcome. And so we thought, well, what, why not kind of package all these things together so that not everyone who is running a business or starting a business has to learn how to do these things the hard way. A lot of these things are common sort of themes and we mm -hmm. wanted to package them all up in a way that people who are reading it could feel like, oh, like, that's the same thing I'm trying to figure out. And now I have just one solution to this one thing I'm trying to solve. Some of the best advice I got out of the book was listening to Lauren talk about how she manages marketing. I like, you can learn a ton um, and it's very usable and pragmatic. 
I think you organize the book really by topic of of kind of need, right? Like funding or hiring, right? I think it's a pretty easy read. And if you're thinking about starting a business, it probably makes sense to read it from cover to cover. But I also think it was meant to say, you know, if you're running a business and we understand time is probably one of your most precious resources, and you just need an answer to something that's extremely topical that you could actually go into the book, look at all of like the index and all the chapters and say, I need to read this section on how to hire because that's the thing that's top of mind for me right now. And you could go right there. You could read that chapter and get the information that you need without having to have read the chapters before that. Jackie, maybe you could uh, share with us what you consider to be one or two of the most interesting stories you came across um, in the book. I know there are many to choose from, but, but can you share with us one or two that particularly stand out? Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's a woman, Letitia Hankey uh, from ARS Roofing. Um, it's in Oakland. She has incredible stories to tell about the obstacles she faced as a business owner and how she confronted them. So she is a black female in the construction and solar business. And she recalls a story when she went to a client and they met her, they kind of shook her hand and then said like, oh, I'm sorry, we've decided not to proceed with the job. And she knew that was totally untrue. She walked out, she started bawling. And at that moment, she decided her way to approach her business going forward, which I thought was genius, is to put her face and full name on her website so that you knew when you were calling her company who she was and what she stood for. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be genius, right? Like you're calling her because you want to work with her because you realize she's super high integrity and good at what she does. Mm -hmm. And anyone who chooses not to call her didn't waste her time because yeah. she's too busy to deal with that waste of time. Right. And I just thought that was like an amazing, uplifting, incredible story. But there are there are tons of others. Um, I don't know, Lauren, who's your favorite? It's hard to say. I, I think to Jackie's point, like there's so many incredible stories and we try to start every chapter telling a little bit of somebody's story. I think I, Leticia is definitely up there for me as well. I think Peter Stein, who's the oyster farmer, Jackie mentioned earlier, he's mentioned in a couple of chapters. I think he has applied a lot of innovation to his business plus it's just a topic I know nothing about, oyster farming. So we learned a lot from listening to him and how he talked about his techniques. But I would say, I think just an example in Peter of somebody who was able to pivot quickly during COVID. I mean, his business was fully selling to restaurants and then COVID restaurants shut down and he had to quickly pivot to a direct to consumer model. And he talked about just hacks and things that he was doing, including using his friends like bus routing software to help him optimize his delivery routes so that he could make sure that he wasn't spending 16 hours a day in the car. And I think one of the things that's really interesting in, in kind of the timing of when Jackie and I did the interviews and wrote the book is that so many business owners were going through this time of incredible adaptation and just showing a lot of ingenuity and resilience. And it's great because now that we're sort of in this world where things are more open again, I, I, what we've found is a lot of business owners have actually discovered that they have now like a diversified revenue stream. You know, now Peter's back to selling to restaurants, but he still has a direct to consumer business and he has like an in-person event business in the summer. And so I think that that is something that is sort of the silver lining for a lot of business owners coming off the back of the pandemic. Yeah, uh, you touched on the uh, use of technology there, and I, you know, our, on our show we speak a lot about technology and how small businesses use or should use technology, and you know, CRM systems, how they should stay in touch with their customers, things like that, how to introduce automation. Any key learnings about technology and how small businesses do or don't use it? You mentioned some there, and you know, suggestions for how they should think about uh, better using technology in the future. I think this is actually such a great question. So thank you for asking me this question because one of the things that we see was like during COVID was this like incredible, like speeding up of the adoption of new technology. So what, what we would typically see as a three-year time frame ended up happening in three weeks. But I would say like what one of the biggest things that I would continue to say to small business owners is that they need to keep thinking about adopting technology and how do they adapt their business. I think it can be hard and scary because a lot of 
business owners like to really keep a tight rein and have a lot of these things in their control. But given some of the, the challenges that we've seen of late, whether it's inventory or staffing, these are all things that technology can really help with. So if you run a restaurant, for example, and you're short on servers and you have QR codes, then it doesn't really slow your business down as much. You don't have to sort of seat at 25% capacity, for example. And so there's lots of ways I think that technology can really enable business owners to move faster. And I think a lot of, we're seeing definitely faster and more adoption, but there's still a lot of people that are very nervous about sort of migrating components of their business to a technology stack to really help support them. But I would say it's probably one of the biggest levers that they have in terms of just freeing up their time, whether that's automating your payroll, whether that's, you know, allowing working with a fintech company to get access to a loan. There's so many ways I think that technology can really help small business owners. And it's, you know, one of the things that the entire fintech sector is focused on is democratizing access to tools that would have only been available to larger businesses in the past. So there's definitely like a lot of options out there, probably in a way that can feel really overwhelming. But I do think that hopefully we'll start to see more business owners really um, start to adopt more technology solutions to help them run their businesses. Yeah, Lauren touched on it, but once you have your business on a fully automated system, the ability to finance yourself, the aperture of where you can do that is, is greatly opened because you can now look at financing options through your credit card company, through digital payment systems, through point of sale systems, through tax software, through accounting software. You never before had real-time access to credit. And these products are incredibly empowering for folks who need small loans, anything less than $100,000. And so the ability to immediately access it without additional paperwork is key. Lauren, during, the, uh, during COVID, uh, we heard about you know, record numbers of people quitting their corporate jobs and jumping in to start a new business. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, for those who are thinking of you know, quitting their day job, so to speak, um, what process do you recommend? Should they just jump in, maybe do it as a side hustle first? What's, what's your thinking on that? I think it depends on what the idea is. Definitely a side hustle, I think will allow you to sort of, it can be very hard if you have a corporate job and you're also trying to do your side hustle, but we do hear from people all the time. It's a great way, I think, to dip your toe into entrepreneurship and see how you like it because it's definitely not for everybody. Um, I think that it's it's hard, right? And so I think to Jackie's point, you know, you got to make sure that you're passionate about it, but sometimes you could be passionate about something and it doesn't have an audience. So I would say, you know, a side hustle allows you to sort of dip your toe into something that you're passionate about and also understand, okay, who is this for? I think to Jackie's point, we strongly advise at least putting together some type of business plan because depending on what your business is and how much overhead expenses you need, you also need a plan of how much money do you need to have saved in order to go and start your business. So I definitely wouldn't recommend that people sort of quit their job without any sort of plan to go pursue a passion without doing some of the work of understanding, like, this is a passion for me, but who else is it a passion for? And what's the market for this right now? What would it really take? And then starting to develop a plan so that you don't get into that situation where now you've started and you're sort of struggling to, to pay your rent or some other things. And then you have to start asking people in your family for money and you kind of get into that very uncomfortable territory, which I think can create a lot of extra stress in the beginning of your journey. Jackie, what, what would you say were your biggest surprises in writing the book? You know, things maybe you thought going in one thing and you came out realizing something else. Uh, you know, we started with sellers that we had almost cast as we both of us talked about, we tried to find diversity around business type, around people, around state. Um, and it didn't matter who we talked to, there was always an interesting story. And it could be the auto mechanic who had a very limited education, but could tell you how he manages his supply chain. And it was it's heartwarming to listen to these stories uh, from people when 
you know that his description of running a supply chain at a very small, you know, rural local level is actually kind of insightful and the same as far more sophisticated companies. And even he doesn't realize it. And I think that was very surprising how many stories there were and not just from the people that we knew had big personalities. The wisdom from dirty fingernails is extraordinary. We're talking with the authors of Self-Made Boss, Advice, Hacks, and Life Lessons from Small Businesses, and we'll be back in just 30 seconds. We're going to be talking a little bit more about the state of small business in today's very uncertain climate. At Winning on Main Street, we love speaking with successful entrepreneurs and hearing about their amazing journeys. And here's one we definitely recommend, The Million Dollar Bakery. If you want to read an inspirational story of someone who dropped out of high school and built a million dollar business with no previous experience, you must check out The Million Dollar Bakery. It's the self-told story of Rebecca Hamilton, the CEO of Chick Boss Cake, a successful bakery business in Toronto, Canada that we highlighted in Winning on Main Street episode 116. Rebecca is a dynamic speaker and in her book, she shares her amazing story with the hope of inspiring others to create the life of their dreams. Again, the book is The Million Dollar Bakery and it's available through Amazon and other retail outlets. Oh yeah, if you're anywhere near Toronto, go check out Chick Boss Cakes, three locations where you can get fantastic bakery items of all kinds. And we're back with the authors of Self-Made Boss, uh, Lauren Weinberg and Jackie Reese. This great discussion about this fascinating book and it seems so timely now for so many people trying to launch their small business to have this playbook. So Lauren, I had a question for you about big businesses versus small businesses. So, you know, we've watched as big businesses, they just know so much about us as customers. You know, you think about these companies you do business, they, they know what book you read or what pizza you ordered. And, you know, they ping you just at the right minute with, why don't you try this? Or why don't you buy that? Just click here and you'll get it in 10 seconds to the earlier point about, you know, their CRM systems and how they're able to sort of, you know, know your desire and when you want it. How, how do you talk about, or do you talk about in your book, you know, small businesses competing with that? Like how, how do I as a local business compete with a big business? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of it will come down to how those businesses are surfaced in search results. And I know that that's something that a lot of the big platforms are working on, which is, you know, if you're searching for products or goods, for example, Google Shopping, how do you have a good representation of, you know, smaller and also big businesses? And so I think that 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 there's definitely a good amount of that that just needs to come in the discovery phase. I would also say that by and large, I think a lot of people want to support local businesses. And I think to your earlier point, part of it is just the convenience that big businesses offer that some smaller businesses have not. And again, I think this is where technology comes in. So if you have a website, if you offer shipping, A, I think that kind of just means that your business is more discoverable through search and other platforms, but also that that customer experience is really easy because as much as somebody may want to support their local business and you want to pay your invoice on time, I think not sort of acknowledging that people are very used to online shopping, people like to be able to get things delivered, like I think that small businesses need to be able to offer the same level of convenience that consumers everywhere are used to. And the good news is, is that they can. It's just really a question of, again, sort of adopting technology, thinking about your marketing presence as well. But I would say like the desire is there probably now more than ever. I think after everyone sort of being at home for a while now, they're more aware of their local business community than ever before, because a lot of the businesses in their community have been sort of in jeopardy since the pandemic started. And I think for a lot of people, myself included, if you think about where you live in your town and your main street, you don't want to see those things go away. And so the desire is there to support it. And I think that it's really also on the business owners to, to sort of recognize where people spend time and how they like to shop and consume and to try to make it as easy as possible, even in the example that Jackie was just talking about, like using technology to schedule appointments and sending text message reminders to people like that is the difference between somebody like showing up and not, and it can all be automated. And that really, I think, saves 
businesses a lot of time and money because they don't have to hire someone just to book appointments or take time out of their day to do that scheduling work themselves. Great points. And we just have a few minutes left, but I did have, want to ask you one or two more pointed questions about what's going on today. Uh, you know, current economic conditions, obviously very tough for big and small businesses, inflation, supply chain, labor shortages. Uh, is there anything in particular that you recommend for small businesses, maybe it's back to the technology point, about how to get through this very challenging moment we seem to be in right now? You know, some of the biggest questions right now are HR related. <clears throat> and the one thing we haven't touched on for small businesses hmm. is to be intentional about their culture. Um, you know, people want to work at a place they enjoy and they want to learn, they want to have a great working environment. And so there are a lot of ways that you can create a culture, even in the smallest companies. And I think a lot of times, um, smaller companies think that's a topic that can be left to larger ones, but I don't think that's the case. Well, that'll be the last word for us. We're out of time, but I want to thank you both, Jackie Reeses, Lauren Weinberg. Uh, fascinating discussion, and it's an awesome book. I, I assume people could just go online and find this anywhere, Amazon, yep. Barnes & Noble, et cetera. Yeah. Absolutely. Here's, Here's the, the cover. Book. Yeah, looks great. Well, congratulations on your success in getting this done. And uh, I, hope, I hope the book is uh, read by all, our, all our, of our listeners. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for having us today. And yeah, you can also go to our, wealth, our website, selfmadeboss.com, and it'll show you all the places you can buy the book. And you can learn a little bit more about the businesses that are featured, just so you know what you're getting into. But thanks again for having us today. It was great to be on your show. Great to have you on the show. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend or colleague to subscribe. And please leave us a five-star review. Helps us in the rankings. We'd really appreciate it. Until next time, make it a great week. Oh, 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 oh,